and welcome to uh, Gisborne Church of Christ as we uh, gather together virtually. Uh, just hopefully this will be the last week that we're uh, gathering in this way, but um, even though we're all in our different houses and uh, just tuning in remotely, uh, we still believe that God's, God's at work among us. He's at work in your life. He's at work in our congregation, and he is wanting uh, to touch us and to change us and give us uh, a meaningful experience in our worship and in communion and in sharing around his words. So I just invite you uh, to just um, settle your heart and come to that place where you can engage with him and allow the Holy Spirit to touch you and change you. Uh, we do, of course, have our notices at the end of this um, at the end of this service. We'll have our notices on the blackboard and also going out through the week through our newsletter, which will come out on Tuesday because of the public holiday and on Instagram and Facebook. But I do want to just uh, highlight um, two or three uh, notices this morning. Uh, firstly, that we do have our One Church prayer meeting on Wednesday night at eight o'clock on Zoom. Uh, the link will be in the buzz on the day, and it's a, just a great chance for us to gather remotely and pray uh, for our church and for one another and for different needs that people may have. And then again on the uh, <clears throat> 20th of June, our evening service at 6.30 p.m., Sunday the 20th, uh, we're having a farewell service for Naomi, who has uh, served this church for a long time and uh, it's just be great if everyone could come, whether you usually go to the morning service, if you could just put in your uh, diary to come uh, on that week in the evening as well, that we can just show our appreciation to her for her service and celebrate her contribution uh, to Gisborne Church of Christ. And uh, finally, the other thing I wanted to mention was uh, our, our prayer event. We're calling it Change the Future Prayer Event. That will be uh, on Tuesday, the 6th of July at 7 p.m. And uh, again, we're asking everyone to come. Uh, we're all in this together. We want to see God move through this transition season and unfolding his plans and purposes in uh, 2022 and beyond. So uh, we're just having this time to come together uh, to spend um, time in worship and also time in prayer, just lifting up um, all of these issues uh, to the Father. So please also put that date in your diary. Uh, 6th of July, 7 p.m., uh, come along and uh, let's all pray and worship God together. So uh, <clears throat> just as we hand over to the worship team this morning, uh, let's just turn our hearts upon Jesus, focus in on him, allow the Holy Spirit to work in us and amongst us. So let's just pray and then we'll move into worship. Father, we thank you uh, for your presence in our lives, for your presence in our congregation, Lord, your uh, desire that we would have intimate encounter with you when we worship. And we pray, Lord, that you would facilitate this this morning by your Holy Spirit, that you would anoint the worship leaders and, Lord, you would touch each one of us as we come. And, Lord, and wait on you and engage with you uh, through the presence and power of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. When the best of men Slamming all the dolls in 
over the last few weeks and I'm sure a lot of us are feeling that with um, the COVID lockdown again and um, you know the storms that we've just had uh, you know I hear mice plagues in New South Wales and all sorts of things happening in this world that we seem to have no control over and I feel like it's a bit um, it's it's hard it's hard work but I want to encourage you this morning um, as we come around this table of communion um, that reminds us of what Jesus has done for us. And that's a really, really important message at this really difficult time. I was sort of reminded um, of the, uh, the song, um, It Is Well With My Soul, and uh, that was um, penned by Horatio Spafford um, after the death of his four daughters out on the sea, my soul, when he's just lost four daughters. And I pondered that a lot. And I believe that it's a matter of faith and it's a matter of believing in God and what Jesus has done for us through his salvation and how we express that and participate that within communion. And then I also believe that there's God's word that gives us the encouragement that we can get up again, that we can get out of the boat when the storm's raging, that we can walk on the water. We can do all those things in faith if we believe that God is in control. And I want to remind you as a church, he is. I just want to turn to you, um, to, if you could, um, for Psalm 42. Um, verses um, 5 through to 8. And sometimes we have to talk to ourselves. We have to encourage ourselves as well as others. And the psalmist says, When my soul is in the dumps, I rehearse everything I know of you, from Jordan depths to Hermon heights, including Mount Miser. Chaos calls to chaos in the tune of whitewater rapids, your breaking surf, your thundering breakers crash and crush me. Then... God promises to love me all day. Sing songs all through the night. My life is God's prayer. And then in 43, Psalm 43, he says, Give me your lantern and compass. Give me a map so I can find my way in the sacred mountain, in the place of your presence, to enter the place of worship. Meet my exuberant God. Sing my thanks with a harp, magnificent God, my God. And he talks to himself in both of these psalms. The psalmist talks to himself and encourages himself. And he says this, why are you down in the dumps, dear soul? Why are you crying the blues? Fix my eyes on God. Soon I'll be praising again. He puts a smile on my face. He's my God. What a great, great encouragement that's been to me. And I hope that it's an encouragement to you. As you're listening to it because this communion that we do together and I'm going to take you through now is all about that where Jesus says in Corinthians Paul says in Corinthians this is my body broken for you and he's talking about Jesus's body this is my body broken for you do this in remembrance of me if you can take your the bread the biscuit that you have uh, let's eat that together and remember that this is Christ's body that was broken for us. Thank you. And then after supper, he did the same thing with the cup. Jesus did the same thing, saying, This cup is my blood, my new covenant with you. Each time you drink this cup, remember me. Let's take the cup and let's drink together and let's remember our wonderful, wonderful Saviour.
and our God who is still on the throne, he makes the difference. Father, thank you for this time. And I pray your blessing upon this church, upon each and every person, that they may experience the power and the love of God today, right now. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So the, this morning we will just uh, continue our series or complete our series on uh, entitled Who's in the Mirror, where we're talking about our, our personal uh, perception of ourselves in contrast to how God might perceive us to be or, or the things that God anticipates doing in our lives and uh, how we can close that gap and uh, be transformed more and more <clears throat> into the person uh, who God sees and who God wants us to be, and of course, it's where the uh, the word, the word, and the work of the Spirit converge in our lives that we can expect uh, transformation to take place. So, for that reason, we dig into God's word, and we also, of course, uh, <clears throat> wait on the Holy Spirit and um, open our hearts and minds for Him to move and to apply. Uh, the truths that are revealed here uh, into our lives in a way that really fits our context uh, all these um, 20 centuries later. So we're very much dependent on the Holy Spirit to speak to us, to touch us and to change us. So uh, we'll just pray now and invite him to do just that. So wherever you are, I just encourage you to position yourself in a way that, um, that you're just saying to God, here I am, uh, come and touch me this morning. Uh, with your presence and with your power and do your transforming work in my life. So, Father, we do come in Jesus' name. Uh, we're grateful for your presence. We're grateful for your work in our lives. Lord, we want you to do uh, great things in us and among us. And so we just do open our hearts and minds to you at this time and ask you to anoint your word in a way that's personal and powerful and transformative uh, to us. Amen. I remember hearing a story a long time ago about a, a, an eagle, an eagle's egg uh, somehow finding its way into a chicken pen. And uh, this little eagle egg hatched in the chicken pen among all the baby chickens. And as this little eagle looked around uh, and saw the way that all the chickens were behaving, of course, it began to copy, so it could become, you know, one of the herd of the chickens. So as it grew up, you had this um, amazing side of this uh, ever-growing eagle in amongst all these little chooks and chickens pecking around on the ground and uh, not realizing that it had these magnificent wings and that it was able actually uh, built to fly and to soar in the sky. It was completely bound to the earth. And then one day, um, 
another eagle, maybe its mother, swooped down uh, into the chicken pen and picked up this little eagle, this um, baby or child or teenage eagle, whatever, and carried it away high, high, high uh, into the sky. And it was able to look down at that little chicken pen disappearing and something was going on in the um, mind of the eagle as it began to realize that it wasn't actually a chicken. It was made to do something else. And then the mother just let this little baby eagle go and uh, out came the wings and it began to fly. And it began in that moment to see itself uh, as its mother <laughs> saw it rather than the way that it had perceived itself uh, to be this little chicken. And now this is, the, this is the kind of thing that we're talking about that we would begin to more and more see ourselves uh, in the way that God sees us rather than the way that we see us when that disagrees with the way God sees us. And this is a process of transformation that God has called us all to walk and to embrace uh, in our journey going forward. I had another, uh, I had a, not a story, but an actual encounter with an eagle uh, a long time ago uh, on our honeymoon, a very long time ago. And uh, we were in um, Katoomba in the Blue Mountains uh, west of Sydney and we were um, getting a coffee in this amazing uh, Art Deco hotel that's there called the Hydro Majestic. And uh, it had, had this like dining area looking out over this valley, this uh, magnificent valley in the Blue Mountains and a uh, huge glass window. And uh, we were there. And of course, when you looked out, you saw down the valley. But when you looked down, uh, we were in an incredibly high place. And as we sat there, there was this eagle there. And it was just floating on this upcurrent of wind that was carrying it. That, that, that the eagle was able to actually uh, not exert any energy <clears throat> and just sit there on this upcurrent of the wind and to do something that it couldn't do without that wind. If that wind suddenly stopped or that upcurrent suddenly stopped, it would have to begin to frantically, you know, flap its wings and begin to fly under its own power. Eventually it would get tired, of course, and it would have to go and, uh, you know, sit on a tree or go down on the ground because there was this, this force that was carrying it. And, you know, you wonder what would happen, you know, that we have uh, a certain... Um, way that we identify and perceive ourselves. We have certain abilities that we're aware of. But, you know, do we really understand the full potential that we have uh, as believers in Jesus Christ? And, you know, what would happen in the things that could flow out of our lives if we, like that eagle, were carried not on a natural wind, but on the wind of the Holy Spirit who would anoint all of the abilities that he's placed in our lives and enable us to, to achieve amazing things. So today I want to talk about uh, our personal uniqueness empowered by grace. This is the third um, message in our series. We've talked about personal value and personal identity. So now uh, let's look a little bit at personal capacity or personal ability uh, that God is wanting uh, to bring out in our lives so that we can flourish uh, as he has called us to. <clears throat> Paul um, talked about this idea of grace being at work in his life. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 15 verses 9 to 10, he said, I am the least of the, of the apostles who is not even worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But he says, by the grace of God, by the grace of God, I am what I am. This is a great statement to be able to make. I was this other person, but now by the grace of God, I am what I am. And he says, it goes on, his grace towards me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than the other apostles. Yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. So he has this idea of God's grace laboring with him 
changing him into who he was now. Not the person that he was when he met Jesus, but he says, by the grace of God now, I am what I am. And it's the grace of God that's laboring in me to cause this you know, abundant work product, if you like, to flow out of my life. In Ephesians 3, he says a similar thing. I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of his power. Although I am less than the least of all God's people, this grace was given me to preach to the, un- to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. So he had this understanding that God's grace could empower a person to be someone that they could never be in the natural. They could, you know, they could become a person who was uh, floating and and um, carried by the power of the Holy Spirit, the power of God to do things they could never do in their own strength. Well, that's great for Paul, but he he speaks in another place and says, hey, this is for all of us. This is, in fact, Christianity 101 in many ways, that God is wanting to gift each and every one of us as members of his body so that we can function not only in our natural abilities, but in certain places and in certain ways with supernatural capacity that comes from him so that um, our capacity now exceeds the natural capacity that we were born with when um, God's gifts are added to that mix as we open our lives more and more to him. So uh, he talks about this whole idea of uh, individual giftedness in the body of Christ. And so um, we've read already, uh, of course, a a number of times from Romans chapter 12, uh, the first part uh, particularly, uh, where in the New Living, uh, Romans 12, 1 (coughs) to uh, two says, and so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all that He has done for you, or, or and let them, your bodies, be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind He will find acceptable. This is an amazing thing that Paul would recommend us that we <clears throat> metaphorically place our body on an altar, but it's an altar of surrender. It's an altar of giving our lives over for God's glory and God's purpose. And then after that, it says, this is truly the way to worship him. Give your body to him for his purpose. And he goes on, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world. And uh, I did uh, say uh, last time that this word world comes from the Greek word cosmos. It actually doesn't. Somebody pointed out to me, thankfully. So I'll correct that now. It's actually the word eon, which is age. So it's saying, don't be uh, conformed to the behavior and customs of this age with the age to come, of course, in focus, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Don't be conformed to this present age, but let God change you into a new person by changing the way you think, then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Wow. God's will for you is good and pleasing and perfect. And jumping down, he talks about uh, these gifts that he's given us, just as our bodies have many parts, each part has a special function. So it is with Christ's body. We are many parts of one body and we all belong to one another. So he likens this uh, company of believers to the human body. All their different body parts are different, our ear, nose, fingers, hands, whatever. And then he goes on and says, in his grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. You've been given gifts by God for doing certain things well. So if God has given you the ability to prophesy, speak out with as much faith as God has given you. If your gift is serving others, serve them well. If, it is, if you are a teacher, teach well. If your gift is to encourage others, be encouraging. If it's giving, give generously. If God has given you leadership ability, take the responsibility seriously. And if you have a gift for showing kindness to others, do it gladly. 
So we'll look at these um, gifts themselves more closely uh, uh, in coming weeks. But uh, what we really want to focus on today is that this is one of the things that adds to our sense of personal uniqueness. And um, the source of our competence is God's power working through our personal uniqueness. As uh, Paul says uh, in another place in 2 Corinthians 3 verse 5, our competence, our ability, our capacity, our competence comes from God. He has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant. So we've been looking at these issues of self-perception, and sometimes we might not have the perception that we're very competent or, or we have great capacity or ability. We might disagree in our minds, and as we look in the mirror, not see the competency, the capacity, the ability uh, that God has freely given to us by his grace. So uh, as we as we uh, go forward in this, I'm I'm hoping <laughs> that uh, each of us uh, are coming to see more and more clearly who we are, being reminded of who God has made us and called us to be, We're being reminded of our value as our people that Jesus died for, being reminded of our identity as as God's children, as fellow heirs with Christ, as as being forgiven and holy and blameless and and filled with God's spirit and these things that we've talked about previously. But today, what about this this, um, third question? Going on from value and identity, this third question of personal capacity, which is an issue that really does um, speak into this whole um, area of self-perception. You know, what are my abilities? What is my capacity? Am I good at anything? (laughs) Has God called me to do something that will be anointed by him? And of course, uh, knowing our or living in the area of God-given capacity and God-given ability will give a sense of fulfillment. You know, Jesus said, my, my food is to do the will of God and to finish his work. That was a sustaining thing in his life, that he was actually functioning in the role, in the purpose, in the place that God had called him to. Well, Each of us is called to such a life of unique productivity. Uh, Ephesians 2.10 says, We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So the spiritual reality is that we are all given certain gifts that God wants to anoint to take us to this uh, realm of... um, a capacity with a supernatural edge. And God's spirit will impress on you a sense of calling, of destiny, of purpose, of function and placement uh, in his body or in mission or some other realm of life. But God is wanting to actually speak into our lives. Jesus said, uh, my sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. So if I position myself as a sheep, as a follower of Jesus, I'm positioning myself in a place where I'm going to hear his voice, where he's going to speak into my life about a myriad of things. But one of the things he'll speak into our lives about is about service, is about our calling, our capacity, the place that he's called us to be. And this could come uh as a, just a clear sense or feeling that God gives us of what we're meant to do, what we're meant to be involved in. It might come as a passion or interest uh, that, you know, consistently engages us. It could be more um, overt, like dreams and visions or a prophetic warning or some sort of scary stirring on the inside that you should step out and do something. It could be actually also through recognition by other people saying to you, look, I have sensed, you know, that that God is calling you into doing this or that or whatever. So these are all challenges. If God speaks to us like this, it's challenged, you know, to take a step of faith and, and to step out a little bit into an unknown place, a place we haven't experienced, a place we haven't gone before, a place we haven't felt free in before, perhaps, or a place we've never had opportunity uh, to, to be and to, and to function. And this, of course, is 
one of the ways that God brings glory to himself, taking us beyond our natural ability, then working through us to accomplish things that obviously was not us, whether that be some uh, ministry function or some other uh, thing that he calls us to do. And uh, he says this, Paul, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, uh, from verse 26, remember, dear brothers and sisters, that few of you were wise in the world's eyes or powerful or wealthy when God called you. Instead, God shows things the world considers foolish in order to shame those who think they're wise. And God shows things that are powerless to shame those who think they're powerful. God shows things despised by the world, things counted as nothing at all and use them to bring to nothing what the world considers important. As a result, no one can ever boast in the presence of God. So often he will put us in positions and roles where, you know, we don't naturally shine. So no one can say, oh, well, that's just him. That's just her. People will actually be saying, wow, he's doing that. She's doing that. That must be God. And the person doing it can't boast like, this is just my natural ability. This is how good I am. No, this is God working through us uh, to demonstrate his glory to those who have eyes to see. So where will God place you? What will he grace you for if you present your body to him as a living sacrifice? What will he begin to speak to you about? What will the spirit begin to stir within you or speak to you uh, through others or whatever? What steps of faith might you be challenged to take in order to find your God-given place of service? And, you know, what gaps will there be between, you know, your perception of who you are and what you're capable of and his perception, his good and pleasing and perfect will for you? So we have these tensions. We have these apparent barriers. Oh, I feel God's wanting me to do this, but uh, I don't know if I can. I don't know if I want to. I don't know if I'll be able to. I don't know if I'm the right person, but it seems like uh, there's something here that God is talking about. <clears throat> so if God is going to get glory out of your life, he will very probably put you in unlikely or challenging circumstances. And in some instances, you're never going to feel ready or comfortable before you begin because of this disconnect. We've looked at a, mentioned a couple of people in scripture that had this experience. We mentioned Gideon, who God saw as a mighty man of valor. He himself saw himself as pretty weak and vulnerable, and he's hiding from, from the enemy that, uh, God is calling him to triumph over. Jeremiah says, uh, you know, when God speaks to him and says, you know, I've ordained you as a prophet to the nations, he goes, oh, I'm just a youth, I can't speak. Or Paul speaks to Timothy and he says, don't let anyone look down on you because you're young, but set an example for the believers in speech, conduct, love, faith and purity. Uh, devote yourself to the public reading of scripture, to preaching and to teaching. Do not neglect your gift, which was given through you through the prophecy when the body of elders laid their hands on you. So Timothy is in, being intimidated because people think, oh, you're too young to be a leader. But Paul's saying, hey, no, 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 don't let people look down on you because you're young, because God put a gift in you when we prayed for you and God anointed you to do something, to, to teach and unpack the scriptures and help people to understand. So many believers have experiences like this, of this, this transformation process of going, going from purely natural ability to embracing some kind of supernatural gift that God has placed in their life. And many of you, of course, have had experiences like this and are living in the outworking of that experience. And uh, so uh, this is this is a very normal part of the Christian life. And, uh, you know, for example, when I became a Christian, I was actually terrified of the thought of public speaking. Yet, you know, in the 35 years since 
uh, I did become, become a Christian. Much of my life has revolved around doing just that. And, and God has clearly had his hand on it. It was his idea. Um, he called me to do it. And uh, he works through that in different ways at different times. And, you know, I've seen him do some amazing things at times, confirming, um, you know, the message <laughs> that, that, I, that he leads me to bring. Uh, but, you know, before I was a Christian, I was actually a person who was um, pretty afraid of groups, pretty intimidated by uh, this whole kind of idea of standing up in public. And uh, I guess uh, as a kid at school, I'd gone through my fair share of um, teasing and bullying. And, uh, you know, I'd learned to stay in the background and not to, uh, to put myself in that position. So it was very unnatural and scary for me to even think of, you know, speaking out even in a small group of people, let alone in a church or an auditorium or, or um, you know, an evangelistic crusade or whatever. And so uh, this was sort of my, my mindset. And even when I got saved at night, I got saved, I knew, like, <clears throat> I've been, you know, I sort of had this feeling, we have to tell the world about this. This is, this is incredible. But... Um, I went to this um, tent meeting in Coffs Harbour a few weeks after I got saved and I was sitting there. There was American evangelist Leighton Ford speaking. He's uh, Billy Graham's brother-in-law. And they had set up this huge tent, 4,000 people. And I'm just sitting there watching this guy and minding my own business. And I just felt the Holy Spirit said to me, I want you to do that. And when he said it, I knew it was right. I knew it was God. I knew it was God speaking to me. But at the same time, the other thing that went on in my mind was I could never do that. How could I ever uh, move from my position of just sitting in the background to being up front like that, overcome all of this sort of fear and apprehension and shyness to be able to do that? And so for the next two years, I sort of wrestled with this, this idea that, you know, God had gifted me to do something, but I had no idea how I could transfer to that into that place. So, you know, I'd go to church and I'd see, you know, other people up, you know, preaching or whatever. But I could I would just think, how could I ever make that transition into that place? And uh, God spoke to me out of a book that a pastor handed to me. He wouldn't have known why he did that, but it was really a God thing. So um, this is a, in 1987 been a Christian for a couple of years, and I read this book called Brother Andrew, or God, called God Smuggler, about a guy called Brother Andrew who was a missionary who used to smuggle Bibles behind the Iron Curtain into the Soviet Union uh, back probably in the 1950s and 60s. And um, he's called Brother Andrew. He's got a world, had a, has or has had a worldwide ministry uh, in uh, missions and reaching uh, persecuted Christians around the world. And uh, this guy, Brother Andrew, uh, he was he's Dutch from Holland, and uh, when he was young, uh, he was in the uh, Dutch army, and he went to the Dutch East Indies, it's now Indonesia, and he fought uh, in some war there, and he became injured. Um, his bullet, his um, ankle was smashed by a bullet, and when he bent, went back home uh, to Europe, he could not walk properly; he had a massive limp. And uh, but when he got back, he also became a Christian and uh, he gave he gave his uh, life to Jesus. And he used to go away and pray and spend time with God in prayer and worship and seeking him. And uh, he and when he would do that, he says that, you know, God would repeatedly say to him, you know, I've called you to be a missionary. And he, he would repeat it repeatedly answer, but I'm lame but I'm not educated, but I can't do that. So, so he's got this self-perception that he is lame and uneducated and unsuited to what God is calling him to do. But God persisted and kept talking to him. And he said, you know, after an extensive period of time and, and you know, a number of these encounters where God's speaking to him about this, um, he came to this place where he actually agreed, even though he was he had this injury, even though he was lame and he couldn't walk. And he, and he writes in his book, God Smuggler, uh, page 62, my yes to God had always been a yes, but, yes, but, yes, but I'm not educated. Yes, but I'm lame. And then he says, with the next breath, I did say yes. 
I said it in a brand new way without qualification. I'll go, I said. Whenever, wherever, however you want me, I'll go. And I'll begin this very minute. Lord, as I stand up from this place and as I take my first step forward, will you consider that this is a step towards complete obedience to you? I'll call it the step of yes. You see how he's pushing past his self-perception and starting to embrace the thing that God is speaking to him. You know, Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. So sometimes God is calling us to walk through that barrier of disconnect between self-perception and uh, who God says that we are. So he says, I took, I stood up, I took a stride forward. And in that moment, there was a sharp wrench in the lame leg. This is God's power coming on his leg. I thought with horror that I turned my crippled ankle. Gingerly, I put the foot on the ground. I could stand on it, all right. What on earth had happened? Slowly and very cautiously, I began walking home. And as I walked, one verse of scripture kept popping into my mind. Going, they were healed. Going, they were healed. This, this is, of course, what happened to the 10 lepers. He's quoting out of uh, Luke chapter uh, 17 and verse 14. When these lepers came to Jesus, they're covered in leprosy. And they're probably really hoping Jesus is going to lay hands on them and pray for them and they'll be delivered from leprosy. But he doesn't do that. He just says, go show yourselves to the priests. And of course, if a leper was ever cured, they would have to go and show the priest that they were cured for them to be allowed back into the community. Because they were, you know, kept apart because they would spread infection. So, so Jesus didn't say, I'll heal you now and then you can go to the priest. He said, start the journey the way you are by faith. And when you get to where you're going, you'll be okay. So these lepers could have done one, one of two things. They could have said, well, that didn't work. We asked Jesus uh, for healing. Master, have mercy on us, they cried out in uh, verse 13. And he didn't do it. He's just given us this silly instruction. It has, makes no sense. Why would we go and show ourselves to the priest when our, we are covered in leprosy? Our, our, the way we see ourselves is not as people that could present like that. But... Fortunately for them, thankfully, they did what Jesus said and they began to walk towards the priest. And Luke tells us that as they went, they were healed. So when they got to where they were going, they were clean. And of course, one of them we know came back to give thanks to Jesus for this healing that happened in the process. So sometimes, you know, God, um, you know, transforms us instantly from certain things, but sometimes it's in the process of pursuing the thing that God's called us to do that change occurs. And so when I read this book that day back in 1987, it was like these lights went on and I realized like I've been fighting this. I've been saying, well, I'm called to do this certain thing, but I don't think I can do it. I don't, I don't feel like I've got the ability or the capacity or the boldness or whatever to do it. But when I read that, it's like suddenly I said, oh, all you've got to do is say yes. And if you say yes, things will change as they did for the lepers, as they did for Brother Andrew. God wants me to live in agreement with his plan and his purpose. So... I just prayed a similar prayer to what I'd read in the book. You know, yes, this is my unqualified yes. I'm going to stop saying yes, but, yes, but, yes, but. I'm just going to say yes. And it was amazing how quickly things unfolded. Within a few months, through a whole lot of supernatural things that happened, I was in a ministry training school. I'd quit my job. I'd moved house. I'd, uh, I'd enrolled in this college. And uh, within six or seven months, I was in, in the Philippines, in another country, uh, preaching in different churches and uh, sharing my testimony and talking to quite large crowds, you know, a couple of times, um, you know, over a thousand people. And it all happened because I said yes. It all happened because I agreed that what the way I perceived myself was not the way God perceived me. And if I agreed with him, his will would start to unfold. And I used this saying for years, in, you know, with all the challenges that came in the in missions and church planting and leading teams and 
Whenever I felt inadequate, it was like I would come back to this revelation. As they went, they were healed. When they got to where they were going, they were prepared. If I'll just step out and keep walking, when I get to the place that God is calling me to be, I will. he will ensure that I have the, the, the things that I need, the resources I need, the capacity I need um, for what he's calling us to do. So as we close, uh, Paul says, we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared beforehand in advance for us to do. So there is some kind of ability and capacity to match in with your value, to match in with your identity, is that God wants to give you a capacity and ability to do stuff that you couldn't do yourself. So maybe there's some impression in your heart and think, you know, I really know that I should be, you know, stretching myself in this certain area of spiritual gifting. But, you know, I don't know where the opportunity is ever going to come. I don't know whether I've got the boldness to step out and do it. Well, it's time to start saying yes to God. Yes, I want to live in the capacity that you are giving me. I want, I want to be like, I don't want to be like that baby eagle thinking it's a chicken. I want to be the baby eagle that learns to fly and float on the currents of air. So as we close off this series, uh, let's just um, finish with the uh, quote from J.B. Phillips I've used a few times of Romans 12, 1 and 2. Don't let the world around you squeeze you into its own mold, but let God renew your mind from within. Let, or the NIV says, let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. So let's just close off there and, and, and pray and... Um, We'll carry on with some of this in the future. But Father, we just thank you for your presence in our lives, for your purpose and plan in our lives. We thank you that our value comes from you. Our identity comes from our place in Christ Jesus. And our ability and capacity comes from our personal uniqueness, empowered by grace. Father, please uh, continue to reveal to each of us who it is that you see, so that when we look in the mirror, we will see the true person that you've made us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys. Yeah.